Hey guys, JB here, the Wolf of Wall Street in the Wolf's Den for another awesome episode. I have an amazing guest today, a very close friend of mine, someone who you're going to be blown away by. This is one of the world's top photographers, I would call him, but he's much more than just that. His name is David Yarrow, and David Yarrow has made a name for himself as being the quintessential wildlife photographer, but in the sense that he combines those amazing shots of like elephants in the savannah and tigers and killer whales, and he somehow gets these world-class beauties, models, like Victoria's Secret girls, famous girls that you know you would see in every major magazine, gracing the covers of Elle and Vogue and whatnot, and he gets them to actually work with the animals live. So you might see a picture of you know a wild wolf like I did with David last year. We had this amazing picture that sold for a record price at the uh, Art Basel Film Festival in Miami. So it was myself with two Victoria's Secret models and a wolf in the model, in the actual picture, and they recreated the whole scene from the boardroom of, of the, the movie The Wolf of Wall Street. That's one example. You have other things where he, he's in the wild with a, 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 literally a lion, and like right in front of the lion is just a world-class model that you'll recognize in two seconds. So I can go on and on. It's just a, some of the most amazing things. And really, I think that we have a lot to learn from David because no matter what you're doing right now, let's face it, we all have become our own photographers. We're all holding a telephone. We're using it all day long to take pictures. And David really goes through all the different things that make a picture great. What makes a certain photograph compelling? Why do people want to look at something for an extended period of time versus something that would almost look at first glance to be identical, but yet wouldn't capture someone's attention. Well, there are actually certain things that David does as a system that would allow you to copy that and create much more compelling photographs, videos that will really drive up your engagement and make people really look very closely at what you're photographing, what you're filming. Uh, again, this goes way beyond just the simple art of snapping a picture. It has to do with, and not just lighting. It has to do with like really what is the main focus? What's in the background? Uh, what are the expressions of the people? And how do you get people to exude the type of expressions that you want? How do you bring something to life that's going to be a still, right? And when you hear David go through this, you'll quickly realize that the massive success he has and the global notoriety is literally the highest paid photographer in the world, I'm sure, by a country mile. You'll see it's not by accident. It's deliberate. It's on purpose. And David has a way of also figuring out how to commercialize something without selling out. So the pictures are both authentic, but they're also commercial, which is a huge thing. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, if it's not commercial, no one wants to pay for it. Well, you know, you're not going to be a photographer that long full time if you can't make a living. David's kind of transcending that form of just art to actual monetizing that art. So it's become a great living as well. We all have something to learn from this. I want to just get to it right now. We're going to have a brief word from our sponsors. And after that, we'll get right into David Yarrow, photographer extraordinaire. All right, listen, you don't need to tell me that running a business is hard work. But if you're still using QuickBooks and spreadsheets, chances are that you're making it far more difficult than it needs to be. That's why it is time to upgrade now to NetSuite by Oracle. Stop paying for multiple systems. Don't give you the information you need when you need it. And ditch all those spreadsheets and old outdated software programs that you've outgrown and just upgrade now. NetSuite is the world's number one cloud business system. Bottom line, it gives you visibility and control over your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, and more. It's everything you need all in one place. And best of all, NetSuite is for everyone. Whether your business is doing a million dollars or a hundred million dollars a year, you're going to save a ton of money and a ton of time as well with NetSuite. In fact, over 21,000 companies are using NetSuite right now, so you'll be in great company right alongside them. So let NetSuite show you how they'll benefit your business with a free product tour at netsuite.com slash wolf. That's netsuite.com slash wolf. 
Schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash wolf. That's netsuite.com slash wolf. All right, David Yarrow. I gotta be very formal with you. Not. <laughs> All right, I have, a, I have a very important question. How would you describe yourself? What do you do for a living? I am a photographer. I think I would describe myself as a photographer that has a big fear of the mundane and a recognition that in order for people to spend a good amount of money on a photograph, it's got to push boundaries in some way, shape or form. We're very content spoilt as a generation and therefore for a photograph to hold people's attention, grab it in the first place and then hold it is, is very tough. I'm a photographer. I like to think I'm more than that. I'm a conservationist. Um, uh, I like to write, um, but it's photography that gets me in front of people. And I just photograph whatever interests me. Do you look at the commercialization of your art as being one of the things that separates you from other photographers, that you have an idea in your mind that it's, listen, I, I want to photograph beauty and things that, that strike me and that move me and that will move other people, but also that you're a, um, a businessman and you always have been and that you have a, a, commer a good commercial sense because in some way, what someone's willing to pay for something, it does peg its value in a way, right? So do you think of things in commercial terms when you're playing out? Like what is it might be beautiful, but not commercially sure. viable? I think there's a line. You were, you were associated with one very famous film in, in Wall Street, but the, the, <laughs> Oliver, the Oliver Stone original Wall Street, there was a line where Gordon Gekko said there's no uh, nobility no in, in poverty. poverty. And I think a lot of artists, rightly or wrongly, took a false pride in having no commercial nouns. And I think there was a generation of artists that thought that if you were creative, you could eschew the normal rules of debit and credit. Uh, and that doesn't, I think everyone, whatever job you do in 2020, you have to do the job, but then of course you've got to look after making money for yourself, for your family, for the people you employ. When we were doing our kind of think tank of ideas, we have two filters. The first one is authenticity because it's very difficult to do things that aren't authentic and they're, they're, then after make money, you've got to be very smart to do that. And secondly, after you've gone through the authenticity filter, the tougher one is the commerciality one. You can take pictures that are authentic. I could go out and take a picture of the biggest dog shit um, <laughs> in a swimming pool and people go, that's never been done before. But they're not going to put it on their wall. Right. So you have the, 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 the authenticity filter and then the commerciality filter. And that gets rid of about 99% of things. In terms of, uh, do I think that I bring to what I do a, a bigger sense of business now? And so I don't know because I don't know. I can't comment on what other people do. All I all I know is that if people criticize me for it, I think it's to me. I'm I'm proud of being a absolutely. I think you're correct yeah. for sure. So, would you say that your force of personality also is a big part of what you do in the sense that? you're able to get certain people into the photographs. Like you have some very famous people mm -hmm. and you get them into exotic, amazing locations. How much of that is just you? Like, cause you're, you know, we're friends personally, right? You're a, you're a magnanimous guy. You're a, you're a fun person to hang out with. And there's something about you that just sort of inspires. Hey, let's do it. Like you came to me with the idea and I was like, yeah, great. And like, how much of is it, is it your ability to communicate this to other people? It gets them excited. The, 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 the subjects. Sure. Uh, I, I, mean, I don't know, Jordan. I do know that manners are important. And if you can start off with good manners and not be presumptuous. Uh, and then after that, um, hopefully charm them, emotionally invest in them, ask them about themselves. I'm so bored of myself. I mean, I'll talk about myself a little bit now, but I really want to talk about everyone else rather than me. Um, I'm fed up with myself. Uh, so I, it's it, one of the great joys of, of my job, and you have it too, is, is meeting sensational people. Absolutely. And um, fame, I think, is an amplifier. If someone's a dick, and they're famous. They're a world even, class. Dick. They'll become a world class. Yeah, dick. like money's the same thing. Money's an amplifier if, if, as well. If 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 uh, someone's charming and fun, and they're famous, they can continue to be both charming and fun, and maybe amplified. Yeah, because you can't quite believe they're doing it in front of you and being so charming in front of you. My my ex my experience is that. Um, if you, if you don't ask, you don't get. It's the Wayne Gretzky quote, you know, I've missed all the shots I haven't taken. And 
you get it. I got a lot of rejection with girls in the early days and in the latter days. <laughs> There's nothing's changed. More, more in the latter days. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a constant. Sorry. To, that, um, <laughs> uh, so uh, rejection is something that is part and parcel of what you do. But if you don't ask, you don't get. I think it's got easier and embracing art with philanthropy whereby you turn around to some of these people and say, listen, um, rather than us paying you 25000 what about we pay you nothing? And if it works, we'll we'll send four hundred thousand to your um, the charity you support or the hospital right. you support. So I think that's been quite a smart model uh, to work on. And of course, the more people you get it right with, the more ambassadors you have on your side to say this guy is he knows what he's doing, and you'll have fun, and he's not a creep, and uh, all the things that the boxes that they can tick against photographers as bad things. Hopefully, I haven't got too many of those. Was this your first evolution of your life as, a, as an adult or you did other, was, was like, did you become a photographer like straight into adult or no, you were doing something else in, in uh... well, well, I was, I was a late developer, probably much like yourself. So I classified my, my adulthood in my fifties. I think before that I was a kid. Well, every woman I boo said, you're so immature. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm still like, right. so I reckon uh, in my, but when I was 15, 16, 17, I loved sport like you did. Uh, so I would, if I, and I was shit at most of them other than table tennis and pool. So in, if you're Scottish, the only sports you can really play are the ones that happen inside a bar or, or golf occasionally. And I wasn't very good at golf. Um, so I thought, but football or soccer, as you call it, was, was our national yeah. sport. So I used to photograph a lot of that. And then I just got a little bit lucky. I managed to get, get on the touchline of bigger games to the world cup in Mexico way back in 86, which shows how old I am. Uh, and, but then I did Olympics, uh, I had an economics degree and there was a bit of parental pressure, a bit of peer pressure. And of course that film Wall Street had just come out and everyone wanted to be a bond trader at Salomon's or something like that. So I thought, do I really want to sit on the touchline of when it's minus 20 and the snow is coming horizontally in your face or do I want to sit in a dealing room and try and be Bud Fox? And that's kind of what everyone wanted to do in right. those days. So, and that's how I got started. Yeah, so, so that's that's what I did. And I'm glad I did do it because I met a whole host of people. How many years were you on Wall Street? I worked for a big bank for uh, eight. In London, the city? In, or in, in the London, United London and New York. And then I set up a hedge fund in uh, 1998, just at the time of the, the big first big run up in tech stocks. And I kind of, uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. And because I didn't understand risk, uh, if I got it right, I did well because I didn't understand risk. Uh, if I knew, uh, when I started what I was doing, my returns probably wouldn't have been quite so high. I was quite cavalier in my strategy. But um, in 9-11, uh, I was in America in 9-11. Of course, European markets, unlike American markets, were, were open. And uh, there was just something that I'd, I just didn't, like I'm not trying to be smart. I'm not trying to be a Monday morning quarterback. But we 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 sold everything we had before the second plane went in. We didn't profit from it, but we removed risk from the table. Goldman's took all the stock offers, and so I went from being uh, a kid that didn't have a clue, that ran very little money, to a kid that still didn't have a clue, but was running quite a bit more money. And uh, Goldman's looked after us on the prime broking side, and suddenly I went from running a small business that I was quite enjoying to employing 30 odd people and uh, um, uh, having to understand uh, numbers like sharp ratios and things like that, which beforehand I didn't really have a clue, but yeah. I suddenly realized that the risk reward, I was looking after institutional money and, um, and it was, a, well, you know, you know what it's like. It, it was, um, it was pressure. It was high octane. Uh, and perhaps you, gave the least to yourself because you were giving to other people the whole time. And uh, it just, I did it for another, ran the, ran the fund for 16 years, 17 years. Wow. So I went through, I went through. When did you get out of that? I, I finally got sold in 2014, th 2013. Um, but for the, the, the three years previously, I mean, Bertie Madoff effectively finished my business. I had no idea who the guy was, um, but a lot of our institutional money um, had also parked itself with him. Oh. And of course, um, when that happened, there was going to be a lot of redemptions because they had to f look after their redemptions and people could take their money out of our fund with a week's notice. 
So, and it was all the days when you get redemptions through fax machines. So I used to come into the office at like six in the morning and see these just pile of redemption notices. And, wow. And my business was just being ripped up in front How of me. How much did, did you all lose with, with Madoff in the year? Uh, well, we didn't, the money wasn't lost. It was just the, with the was withdrawal of money from our fund. So shareholders used our fund like an ATM yeah. to finance the, their issues elsewhere. So it wasn't like we had a bad investment return. Oh, it's, so it was just that the, the money with the pot of money that we were managing shrank enormously because if you they had to the, whoever these clients were they knew they were going to get a run because they hadn't done the due diligence on Bernie Madoff so people oh but you had invested in Madoff's no, no, funds no, 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 oh no. got it no 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 we just had banks or fund of funds those things in it used to be a big thing in Geneva and sure. whatever that had invested in us as well as him and so when he went down their business was going to go and they had to give money back to their customers so they go to uh, the first uh, place they can find liquidity yeah, yeah. yeah because I, I was an ATM uh, and I promised myself after that that whatever whatever I did in my life as much as possible you, you want to try and put yourself in a position where you're not hostage to things beyond your control of course that's naive because in 2020 as we all know right. we're all hostage to this thing that is not in our control right. but it's not quite as vicious as a business closing down because of someone else's fraud. Sure. And also, I think, um, listen, if you own a rest restaurant, yeah, it's pretty bad, or a cruise liner, maybe not the right business to be in, or even um, commercial aircraft, pretty tough these days, as it's not private. But um, I think there is something to be said that, you know, when you are your own boss with COVID, there are two ways you can handle it. You know, some people are paralyzed with fear, other people can respect the virus and say, yeah, it exists, and I'm gonna still live my life with measured risk, and I think there's a much different outcome for someone that's healthy and younger versus someone that's older and not very healthy. So I think, so what you're saying is basically when you were on Wall Street, you felt like you're almost subject to the whims of the universe, basically. Everything was out of your control, right? There was a lot of that shit. You know, there's a lot of uh, three standard deviation events, whether it be the Greek default or whatever. The Black Swan event. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I was a bit of a, a disciple of, what's his name, Nassim Tlaib. But yeah, yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, there was, there, was, there was clearly the whole um, credit crunch in 2007, 2008, and we had our money um, parked with Goldman's then. And I think if AIG hadn't been bailed by Paulson um, on that Wednesday, then Goldman's would have been in a bit of trouble. And then we managed to escape the whole Lehman situation. But it was just every day you woke up and you thought, what the hell is going to fuck me in the back right now? And at least with what I do now, um, if I have to point the finger of blame at anyone, it will be myself. Which is the nice position to be in. I'm, I'm sure you're a very big critic of yourself. And mm -hmm. I'm a big critic of myself. But if there's going to be problems in my business, I'm going to make sure it's because of me, not not because of anything else that's totally out with my control. When did you launch the business as it is in this shape and form where, you know, you have the... the sort to, of, to 2013. 2013. So, so eight years ago. And, and uh, I'm, I had a divorce, um, unfortunately, and I had two kids going through very expensive English schools. Well, I don't think they're any cheaper over here. But if you turn around to the universe of photographers in the world and say, in order for you to be a photographer and in order for you to be able to put food on your table, you have to earn $600,000 a year just to get going. That's quite a big leap for 99% of photographers. That's not the kind of money. Yes, of course there are, particularly around here, there's going to be some some photographers that are earning that. But those were my kind of numbers because after you're taxed, sure. after, after you've taken the kids to school, paying, paying, paying yeah. alimony, yeah. I, that was the kind of number. And I think if you're leaving, a, making a, a sort of a midlife career change, and you go from a train that's on my train uh, was moving <laughs> very, very train. slowly, slowly. It was moving very slowly. It was, a, it was a steam train, battery train that run out of battery. But you want to try and jump to a train that's at least moving a little bit. So in the evenings when I was still working in finance, I would just home in on my business plan. And my business plan really uh, was born out of watching Breaking Bad. Because when he, <laughs> it's an unusual analogy to make. I want to hear but, this one. Yeah. Yeah. So the key part in his business was when he realized that if he, his route to, 
customer was just simply retail, i.e. flogging crystal meth to a guy around the street, there was a, a ceiling to his business. Whereas if he went wholesale, that opened his whole market up. And playing that trade-off between a cut in margin and a huge boundless markets versus maintaining your margin mm -hmm. and just going straight to the customer. And that was a tipping point in, in his crystal meth empire. And I felt Surely that's what I should do in my photography. I should just find the best gallery in Sao Paulo, the best gallery in, in Chicago, the best gallery in Dallas, Paris, Rome, Tokyo. Uh, but a lot of them in America. We felt that there were sort of 36 cities in America that were better for us than the second best city in the UK. So when you sort of get to an age where you, you go onto your computer and you don't watch porn, which I think for me was I'll mid-30s. Mid, mid <laughs> 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 I'm still haven't gotten there yet. I'm waiting. Uh, there's so much else on the internet. And um, I, I learned this, there's so many cities in America that have got such uh, a surety in terms of uh, culture, education, and wealth. wealth. Um, you know, right down to true. I know from touring the cities; in the, it's, it's all vast in the US. So, yeah. so we just I I I walk the walk. You know, Monday I was in Nashville. Tuesday I'd be in Austin. Wednesday I'd be in Charlotte. Well, maybe not that way around. Pressing was, palms with gallery owners. Yeah, and 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 influential people in all these places. So, basically, whoring myself around. Um, and I'm not saying that whoring myself around comes naturally, but it's not it's not the worst job in the world if you're an artist. If you're whoring yourself around as a hedge fund manager, it's a pain in the neck because most people just tell you to fuck off. Right. Whereas sometimes people will say to me, well, that's a nice picture of an elephant, and then say fuck off. <laughs> also, I think that, you know, when you're, there's something a bit soulless about the whole Wall Street banking game, and, and I think with the business that you're in now as a photographer, doing what you do, I think it's all about soul. And I think that's the part of that, the first element of the equation is, is it authentic? So there's some, uh, there's a, like I think there is a congruency to what you do. So it's sort of like the, it's like, I wouldn't say the ends justifies the means, but when you do have a quality product that people get massive pleasure from. Yeah, I had the um, great honor, um, and it will never happen again, uh, to have uh, lunch with a two-time president um, uh, at SMU with George W. and, and the, the premise for our lunch was art because he spends all this time as, a, as an artist now. And uh, I, uh, I, wasn't, no, I was very excited to, to meet him and he was totally charming. He'd, he'd, I'd done about, uh, um, I don't know, a week's homework on, on him and uh, spoken to a lot of people that he was mates And it was that. Uh, he'd done about three seconds homework on me because that's really all you need to do. And then he, his first question was to ask me about a, a former girlfriend. Um, and uh, so that put it at ease. But he said, when we were talking about finance, he said, and you know so many good people in finance. I know so many really great people in finance. But as a collective, he, as he said, it can be kind of one-dimensional because it's all about a wealth, wealth accretion. That's it. It is about increasing your lot. Um, and that's the joy of art and digital media, if you like, and there's, there's just, a, a, there's more breadth to it. Um, sure, if I am successful as an artist, it means I can maybe have a nicer house or a nicer car, but I'm a shit driver, so it wouldn't be a car. Um, but it's, there is more breadth to it. Whereas if you are running money and you, and your, your constant frame of reference is, what's the Dow up today? What's the Dow down yeah. or whatever? It, is that well, also, you're not, you know, the thing with Wall Street I found is that you're not building anything. You're not creating anything. You're basically trading off of the ingenuity of other more creative yeah. people. Yeah. And there's a certain lack of, uh, of self-satisfaction that comes from that. So the only barometer that you have is money. That's right. Is am I making or losing? And then, so then you need to try to attach some value to that money. So you start buying things. And that's why you see brokers and bankers, they, you know, not one house is enough, three houses and a bigger sure, yacht and another sure. sailboat. And then, sure. you know, so it's almost like the only way to give the money value is to buy things versus when you're creating something, when you go out and do something, like for example, we did this picture, right? Which is amazing, right? And you had this idea, you approached me to a friend, Tony Gallagher, right? Well, yeah. champion, right? If there is one out in the world, he is, um, to do, recreate this scene from the Wolf of Wall Street, right? How long did it take you from the time that you first had this germ of a thought 
to actually seeing it. And then the culmination was probably when we were at Art Basel last year and it sold for a, a quarter million dollars and it was all over, right? So that's, that's like a, you created something and that is like a certain, there's something satisfactory in your own heart that you feel. How long was that process for you? I think in terms of the, 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 the creative juices marinating in my mind, as soon as I had the idea, I knew that we could do it. You were an important cog in that, uh, in that wheel because uh, there are four things in the picture and if any of the four are missing, it becomes less of a picture. The wolf, clearly, you, and uh, the two girls. Right. Uh, and they're, they're all important parts of the picture. But that day, I remember waking up at my Sunset Towers down the hill from here, and I said to my partner, I think I'm in for $145,000 today, i.e. we'd invested 145000 And I thought, I said, I better not fuck up. Um, <laughs> you know, Netflix have a very interesting business model that if they have, if they do a series like The Crown, um, each episode of The Crown, after they've done the, 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 the PR and mm -hmm. whatever, comes out at around about 10 million an episode. I was gonna think it was eight, yeah, six, yeah. 10. So, yeah. so with, with all the bits and pieces that okay. go with it. So you, you, got a, you got an eight series, eight uh, episode series, yeah, they're in for about 80 million. They will then amortize that 80 million over their perceived life of The Crown as an asset for them. So their P&L, will get hit by 10 million a year. I think that's quite aggressive accounting personally, not for me to, to with the greatest respect to Mr. Hastings. I would, I, I think that if you spend like we are um, in New York next Monday, spending 40, 50 grand on a day's shoot, that should come through the p and on the Monday. And the, the thing about that for me is it focuses the mind um, because if you turn around to your staff, all of whom are earning less than that in a year, and you say, that's going through the P&L on Monday. And, oh, by the way, I didn't get a picture because I fucked up. That that certainly focuses the mind on your responsibilities. But it, I think you were excellent. Um, you played yourself very well. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite good when you have to get to play yourself. Yeah. But your eyes, they've got that, which aren't really your eyes, but they're the eyes that people might, might associate with the way the, 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 you know, right. the film. And they have a slightly on the spectrum deranged look, which I think was very clever. You managed to get that, and you were saddled up very nicely next to Daniela. Yeah, which was you, great. You didn't enjoy that at all. Yeah, yeah. You're like, stand close, Michael. Like, really, I'll be fine. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> but we have. There are some um, shoots we have that that don't that don't break even and, and fail, and then we find there's a skew, and there'll be some that if they do work. Um, you can do well. What's tell me about the wildest shoot that you've ever been on and organized, where you've sort of found yourself just in an insane situation and oh, this, and good <clears throat> or that, bad. That's an easy one. Uh, so I thought Detroit. You had to get Detroit before it got better. In a way, as Detroit was cleaned up, it became less of a canvas on which to sell stories. So I had this idea that we'd would use one of the old factories uh, that supplied Ford. I think it's called the, the, the Fisher factory. It used to employ about 55,000 people. And at the top, it's like a, a post-apocalyptic scene. Uh, a lot of graffiti everywhere and, and ruins, but a great canvas on which to tell stories. And then we hired a kind of Marilyn Monroe lookalike to give a, a nod to Detroit in its heyday. And then I thought if, if Marilyn Monroe's gonna go uh, around the ruins of Detroit, she might need a guard dog. So we, we actually got a tiger as our, our guard, uh, uh, a guard dog. And, but what was missing was um, a gang. And it was the time before I didn't really use uh, production companies. So I went up to the concierge at the Marriott and in my very sort of posh English accent, I said, do you know where I can get a gang around here? And, and he said, well, sir, it's not exactly what we do. And the only thing I knew about Detroit was that film with the Eight Mile. So I went down Eight Mile and I went to the dodgiest looking bar you could find. And I sat at the bar watching the American football. And then this dude came up to me and I, I just turned around to him. I said, mate, do you know anywhere I can get some drugs? Uh, and he said, uh, yeah, yeah, just hang on here. And then 10 minutes later, this other guy came up along to me, he was a little bit bigger. And he said, what do you want? What do you want, some blow or what do you want? 
I said, well, actually, I don't, but can you take me to your leader? <laughs> <laughs> take me to your leader. <laughs> take me to your leader. <laughs> so, which I guess in retrospect was a little bit of a risky thing to do. Anyway, so before you know it, I met the, this guy, Terrell, who is uh, the leader of one of the gangs. And he said, what do you want, bro? I said, I said, do you want to be in a movie set with a Marilyn Monroe lookalike? <laughs> and I kind of had him at hello. He said, hell yes. <laughs> so I, we had an 18-strong gang uh, on the roof. And uh, I think sadly Terrell's now in, 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 uh, inside. Um, but there was a little bit of a rumor that the tiger got loose, which it never did. <laughs> but on social media, he got, does the tiger know what he's letting himself in for being loose in Detroit? <laughs> um, I had a... I had a bad moment uh, last year. I think I touched on this when I saw you, but I, I was photographing killer whales um, right up in Siberia. Uh, and killer whales are not... You, I, I can't really swim very well, so the idea of photographing underwater is not going to work for me. Uh, but I was photographing on the water's level on a, on a raft that had been specially designed. And um, it's fucking cold up there. It's like minus 20 and not a huge amount of light. It gets light at about 10 o'clock and then it gets dark at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Wow. And uh, I got the picture I wanted of this orca thrashing through the surface of the water. And I was so cold, I just wanted to get back into the boat and have a whiskey. And in trying to maneuver myself back from the raft uh, onto the boat, the raft actually toppled and hit me on the head and pushed me under the water with these two cameras around my neck. And uh, I had a life jacket on, but I wasn't- The anchors, the cameras, uh, like yeah, yeah, anchors yeah. take you to the bottom. And um, so the, the, the Norwegian Special Forces guys got me out. And, uh, and to begin with, you're, I, was, I was just going through post-survival euphoria and uh, cameras were dead, but the card, the XQD card was still there. Um, and but then I started to get hypothermia, uh, so they said, "Listen, we've got to get you to a hospital quick." So I go to this hospital, and the, the um, I don't want to paint stereotypes of the Scandinavian nurses, but they were very attractive, and as they should be. Yeah, and I they asked me to get naked, and how how was the size of your penis? Uh, at no, 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 it wasn't there. There was just it, it actually was, it inverted. <laughs> uh, and penis the, invertus <laughs> is a disease, right? Well, penis but invertus. The male doctor, he said, did the orca take it? And I said, well, wouldn't have fed him for long. <laughs> but it's really, I don't know if that's ever happened did to you. Did the nurses try to bring it back for you? At least try to say, oh, let's see if we can do some therapy. No, they were, they were just texting their friends. And they said, I've just seen something quite extraordinary. <laughs> or I haven't seen something quite extraordinary. We were looking for something extraordinary. We yeah, still yeah. found it. Yeah, the, the, the posters went up all over this Norway missing penis. <laughs> So what? So is, was, was it a full invert? Actually, a turtle dick, like full in the shell, like completely gone, or was it even like a little little nub of it, like, like maybe a, like a little a, like clit a, thing sticking out? <laughs> like what was it like? Uh, like a, an M M&M. and M. An M and M. Yeah. Like a button. Yeah. button. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's interesting. So how long did the but did, did it ever come back? Was it yeah, some back to being a Mars bar. <laughs> <laughs> Or small Mars bar. Were you like saying to the nurses, you know, it's really not normally like this? Of course. I, I swear. I learned that in Norwegian as well because I've been using it all my life. I swear. <laughs> so, well, no, so let me, I just want to understand this. So not, I don't want to belabor this point, but so were the, were the testicles or those are gone too? Uh, no, they, they're, they're more resilient. Uh, they don't because, I mean, I'm not going to try it again, but from my one empirical study they tend to uh have less um um fluctuation in size in a hypothermia attack i think the pe- i think the, the balls go inside but the the, the, the bag is there so you have like an empty sack like yeah. empty it's like you just unloaded the bags are empty but they're still out so maybe the bags it was there, like, uh, the- yeah i would imagine i think probably you get what do you call uh, do you call them chestnuts in America? Not really, but that's uh, I'm open to it. chestnuts. Okay. Um, what conquer? What do you call those things that you you um, hazelnut? Hazelnut. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, probably about. I mean, I don't. The I family don't, jewels we call them. Yeah, I don't want to dwell on it. Um, I, I think, don't blame you, but still, <laughs> yeah, not a lot to dwell on. <laughs> it's a weird thing, hypothermia, because for about. 45 minutes you think you're just shaking uncontrollably so, yeah so let's talk about besides the, the, your, your absence complete absence of a male <laughs> organ yeah what else was affected by the hypothermia um you you go hot and you go hot and cold so you go through periods of absolutely freezing and then baking 
Um, and uh, then there are other side effects. I think uh, uh, Dara, I mean, just generally, I think the thing is just don't do it. Don't, don't do what I did. How long were you under the water? Uh, two minutes. Two minutes? Yeah. I think that's but enough. the water was, uh, I mean, it was, what was it, probably three degrees or something. Yeah, like that. It's, and it's just, it's just, uh, and then above the water, it's very, very cold. Right. Um, but I got the picture. You got the picture. Yeah. If you, any of you, if you go into there's a that a place in Miami Beach that we sometimes that nice uh, um, restaurant uh, hotel that we go to the the, the, the Thai. No. Um, oh, ma- uh, Mama Tua is Castua. Castua. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's up in the bar there. Really, I think, um, yeah, and I think they tell the story because they, they <laughs> tell the story. Yeah. Have you ever had any of the um, animals, whether it's an elephant or a tiger or a wolf attack? Um, I've had uh, the most the most dangerous moments I've had in my life have have always been with people uh, because people can, <laughs> people can do three things that animals can't do. They can get drunk. Uh, they can buy drugs um, and they can buy guns. Uh, and in some parts of Africa, I go to like particularly South Sudan, which I can't, I was meant to be there about three weeks. So you can't go there now. It's just, it's, it's a bit sketchy. Uh, and I had a gun to my head there five or six years ago. Um, and um, the problem is that you know that they, there's no reason to shoot you other than to show off to the women or whatever, but the value of life's quite cheap there the most dangerous animal in the world might surprise you in terms of my experiences tiger well that, that's not a bad shout but you just would never get out of a car with a tiger you just and the people you can look, look on youtube you can google person gets goes out of car and gets eaten by a tiger it happens a bit um but you kind of you know that lions not so much some lions in, in some parts of africa Elephants, you just got to know their behavior. I think the most dangerous animal, the animal that scares me the most is the hippo. Really? Uh, and the hippo kills more people in Africa than any other animal. Why is that? Um, I don't think they have a conscience and they kill not to eat. Most, most animals kill to eat. Um, uh, hippos don't eat humans, but they'll kill you just because they're pissed off with you. And they'll snap you in half. Um, did, did they be provoked, or they just they see you in their space? Yeah, pro- proximity pro- pro- provokes them, and it's a slight riddle for me because my whole style of photography is to be close. Yeah. Um, so I had an experience about eight weeks ago, um, and what you want to do is get um, between you and the hippo if you're operating from like say twenty yards, twenty five yards, and they're in the water. Um, you should be okay if you're in the water, and also if they have to come over rocks to get you if they come out of the, the water they don't like clambering on rocks they've got quite delicate feet but if, they, if they're on the grass or the sand you've, you've had it because they will run faster than you um, so I was photographing this hippo and I thought I'd be fine uh, because there's rocks between us like sort of if you're out you know on the beach um, I'm sure in the Californian coast there's lots of rock pools and whatever it's not all beachy sand and they just don't like going over those rocks. What I hadn't noticed was that there was a gap in the rocks that they had noticed. And my son was there as well. And he, uh, when you're being chased by a hippo, it's not in your instincts to look behind your shoulder. You just run like hell and try and run up a hill. And, and when I ran up this hill, uh, thinking the hippo was right behind me, uh, and I got to the top of the hill. I looked to my son, and he's laughing his head head off. And he went, "Daddy gave up about twenty five yards ago." But it didn't matter to me. I still had a hippo, and they'll snap you in half. And you see these jaws; they'll just snap you in half. Really? Yeah. So uh, I've got a bit of hippophobia now. I think it's fair to say. I, I was told that tigers are one of the few animals that kill for sport. Is that true? I think that they, they would like a, a a kitten with a ball of string. Uh, uh, and they would kill even if they weren't hungry, which is, I guess, what, another way of asking your question. Um, I went up to Siberia, up to the coldest place I know. is a place called Harbin in northern China, and it's about minus 40 during January. 
and there's there's some big tigers up there in a conservation area and um having having uh the camera in one hand and i'm photographing through a cage and i think the most important piece of camera equipment i've got is a bottle of whiskey i take it everywhere <laughs> so, whiskey yeah drink. whatever what, whatever's in the biggest bottle <laughs> <laughs> Do you, have, you have a favorite brand no i like the ones from isla the kind of smoky scottish Bush mills or... no so so uh, talisker i'm sure it's served over here a lot and like mccallans that's my, my drink i like yeah. mccallans um the um i like this the kind of pt ones uh in america they serve a lot of the pt ones are, are popular here um but some of these big tigers are the siberian ones are fearsome and they are so strong really yeah um but most mo- most of the time I, i'm I, I know animal behavior fairly well polar bears we we cover ourselves in chocolate because the polar bears are very sweet tooth so we'll we'll put chocolate all, all over us and then so long as the polar bear is downwind from you he'll come back to because he smells the chocolate and then the key is to have uh, an escape route from the polar bear uh is the polar bear going to lick the chocolate or eat the chocolate it come to eat you yeah it comes to eat you yeah so it's, it's not something you want to try at home basically. no it's another another don't try at home <laughs> do you find yourself maybe unintentionally or intentionally, let's know which one it is, constantly pushing the envelope, almost like I'm looking for higher and higher cliffs to dive off of and shallower and shallower pools to land in. Do you find that some of what you're doing is almost like what's next? Like you're in these extreme situations that you almost feel like you have to unconsciously or consciously top this, what's the next crazy all? I don't mean for the sake of being crazy, just like, of almost like to get the same level of excitement, you become almost anesthetized to your own <clears throat> sure. behavior, right? Sure. So, I mean, that's a good question, Jordan. And first thing is, uh, like you, I'm a dad, and I will, will never do anything irresponsible. So, the the couple of things I've had in the last fifteen years have been misfortunes that uh, I've never really been had one of those critical critical moments. But it was um, always by accident. It was like you weren't being reckless. Yeah, exactly. Something wrong. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, precautions were taken you uh you never in your craft what you never start a year by saying this year i'm gonna do it less well so in 2021 why don't we just go back a level from 2020 it is with human nature um particularly if if you're in a profession where you don't get less good at it because you're getting older, which obviously a lot of professional sportsmen are not in the position where sure. they can start the year saying, "This year I'm I'm going to do definitely better." Uh, you know, take take an icon like Tom Brady; mm-hmm. uh, he, he's amazing. But in right. fi- in five years' time, I doubt he's going to be able to say, "Next year I'm going to do it better than I did it ten years ago." Um, I, I know it's a, a cliche, but success is ninety nine percent failure. It is by learning how to get it wrong we learn how to get 100%. it right. Um, failure is an in, is integral in the on, on on the road to success. No doubt. And I think our best results are a direct function of the aggregation of all the lessons we've learned from our mistakes. Uh, so there is there is an iterative relationship between failure and ultimate success. And we the one thing that I think that I'm a great believer in. Uh, Warren Buffett used to say that he would invest in businesses, only invest in businesses that had moats around them. He wanted to find these businesses where they had such a competitive advantage, someone couldn't immediately jump in and do what they were doing. So if I was to say that the moat around my business was talent, what a load of wank, what a load of cock. It's not, that's not, that's, I cannot turn, there's so many, that's why I love Los Angeles in normal years is there's so many talented people here. So there's no way I'm going to turn around and say I'm more talented than, than others. I think we've got a, I've got a level of competence that's going to hold me in good stead. The moat around our business is two things. Firstly, the contacts we've got all around the world, that black book of people that fixers, the best person. If I, if I go to uh, some strange part of Peru tomorrow, I might be lucky enough to, to be within one phone call of the person to help me out. Sure. Uh, and I think the second moat around our business is the ability to invest with courage. If you are, uh, whatever happens, whenever this dreadful pandemic ends, um, 
you're going to see an explosion in the art world, in the creative world, in music, in film, uh, in still photography, because I think there's so much pent up creative energy that's waiting to explode. And people have also had time to think, uh, reappraise, get better ideas. So I've come out of the, the, the starting gates a little bit because we've been filming in Africa the last six mm -hmm. weeks. And I do think that whenever this ends, the compensation for those that care about it is that the art scene will be vibrant. Um, we want to uh, attack um, coming out and we have, we're fortunate enough to have the, the, the funding to do that. Uh, if something happened tomorrow that I felt that we should go to, we'd just go there straight away. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, because the bane of what I do is, if, if there's an investment analogy in a way in that we, you, the, the terminology like crowded longs and crowded shorts, I, I don't think there's, I'm, anyone's going to make an investment career from here by just buying Amazon shares. You kind of, the, the horse is bolted a little bit and what are you doing that other continent no one else sure. can do? Um, in the same way, if I'm to photograph, uh, I don't know, some lion in Africa and there's 50 other photographers sitting next to me, well, that's not really art. How can I get something that no one else has, has got? But if we charter our own boat to go into the south side of Antarctica, just us and a film crew in the depth of their winter, uh, no one else is going to be there. And it might cost $250,000 to do it, but we're prepared to take that level of investment because we feel that we'll come out of it with more than 250,000 of original content. So uh, that looking forward, I think that is a very important part of our business model is there's no doubt the biggest mistakes I've made certainly in the last two or three years have been cutting corners on production. So like we're, we're today I've been talking to some, some uh, uh, models at the top of their game really at the top, top of their game. And Alexander Ambrosio is a Victoria's Secret model and a, a superb at what she does. But she will be 10,000 a day more than someone that's not quite at the top of the game, but in most people's eyes, brilliant. It makes sense to invest that extra 10,000. The mistakes we've made have always been cutting corners and saying, well, we can get the whole job down by 20 grand by doing that. Just don't do it. Just mm. get the very best. Interesting. And what would you say the impact that digital cameras have had, like in the sense that nowadays, like your iPhone, it's almost like it's, it does a really good job. Yeah. Do you think that's helped your industry or hurt your industry? It's a good question. Here's a good statistic. In the next two days, there'll be more pictures taken around the world than in the whole history of film photography. In the next two days, there'll be more pictures taken around the world than were ever in total taken in film. How extraordinary is that? And in the next two years, there'll be more pictures taken than bricks in the world. So there's that famous book, uh, Charles Dickens, Ten of Two Cities is the best of times worst and the worst of times. of times. It's the best of times because photography has gone from being a very strange thing that kind of train spotters and child molesters do. Um, <laughs> I didn't fit into either of those two categories, <laughs> there, isn't uh, Into being mainstream, everyone's a photographer. Oh, I'm a photographer. And, and, the, and reality is that they all are. Everyone has the right every day to take a better picture than me. And every, every day someone will somewhere because they'll be in the right place at the right time. Um, so you have got huge overload of content. Getty Images uh, would effectively have been bust if it wasn't, hadn't been bought back by the family. It was one of these private equity deals that went parcel to parcel and Carlisle Brothers brought it and had too much debt. Um, I remember when I took a picture years ago of a shark attack in Cape Town and I thought, this is, I've been trying to get this picture for years and I got my check back from one of the agencies and the check was, I think, about $17,000. And my heart sunk because I worked out it cost me 20000 to take the picture. So I got this picture and I lost three grand. So stock photography is shot to pieces. 
as an industry. If you're if you're a magazine or you're setting up a company and you want to get a photograph and you phone up one of these stock photo companies, you're going to get it at a fifth of the price that you'd have had to pay 10, 15 years ago just because there's so much content out there. What would you say to the average person? Like, I want you, let's let's try to break this down to into like the five key elements for the average person listening to this podcast to take a great picture. What are the five important things? What are the five? Like, just like let's say it's your family and Thanksgiving. What do you look for? Is there something that like what would you if it was you? Like, is it? The like obviously things I guess like lighting, what, what you know, or is it like the is it the scenery? Is it this house? It's centered. Tell me what is it? The expressions. Give me your five. It was five things that you would say with five check. Like let's check one. Check 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 check. It gives you a better chance to take a great memorable picture. So the starting premise would be uh, my hero. Uh, my hero is Steven Spielberg, and when Tom Hanks was asked what was it that made Spielberg the transcending director the cinematographer of our generation, probably the next generation, the previous one, Tom Hanks, who obviously collaborated with an awful lot. He said uh, it's because he has a fluency in the language of what it takes to elicit emotion. That's absolutely bang on. So the first word is emotion. Uh, if a, photo a photograph doesn't have emotion within it, um, it's got to have a, a lot of other fucking good stuff going on. Emotion to me is the bedrock of engagement. Um, and I try also to remember that. Is it going to elicit emotion with you? It's the very same way as uh, I think your first experience of meeting the person you love. Um, do, 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 did the first thing you see, were you was your attention grabbed and was it held? And... A picture has to do that. Great pictures normally can never be taken again. Um, if you look at your tennis player, Rafa Nadal is one of the most expressive tennis players that we've known since the days of Connors and McEnroe or whatever. And I photograph Connors and McEnroe. Uh, but it's very difficult for me to conceive of a, a picture of Rafa Nadal that is so, so different from all the others that it can never be taken again because he has those those emotions. And they're, they're visceral, they're powerful, but he's always going to be on a tennis court. He'll be in a tennis court in Paris later on today and there'll be 80 people around that court photographing. You can get a, you can get a very strong press photograph, but a photograph that stands the test of time, I think it's tough where... Uh, the, the action happens time and time again, like in, in sport. Um, so th that's 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 the second one. Uh, if you go to uh, a wedding reception, here's a bizarre metaphor coming up now, and you arrive at three o'clock in the afternoon to the wedding reception, you got through the church service and you're dying for a drink and you go into this beautiful marquee and you're looking for someone serving drinks and they're 45 meters away um, the other side of the marquee, you go, this is going to be a shit wedding because I'm going to have to go 45 yards to get a drink. Whereas if the first thing you see when you walk into the marquee are rows of people lined up with espresso mar martinis, you're going to go, this is going to be a good one. It's exactly the same with the photograph. When you look into a photograph, you want to see something straight away. You want to see someone serving an espresso martini metaphorically straight away. You don't want um, a loose picture where there's a lot, big distance between the camera and the first thing. Take the Wolf of Wall Street picture. You know how close I was to all of you. Yeah. So that there is uh, a, a comp there's depth to the composition. There's the narratives and all sorts of layers. But the first layer of narrative, the person that was the master of that Scorsese, funnily enough, uh, he, if you look at the filming and the dealing room scenes in the actual movie, there was always stuff very close, as well as getting a sense of place from 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 the background. So that would be uh, the third thing. Uh, so emotion would would uh, be one. Never be taken again would be two. Proximity would be three. The key word in photography, if photography was a language. The key verb in that language is focus. Focus either deliberately includes or deliberately excludes. My photograph, the central character has to be pin sharp. 
There's no room for ambiguity in it. If it's 98% pin sharp, it's not good enough. <coughs> it's like a, a souffle. If I was a chef trying to make a souffle, there'd be bloody disasters. I could never get my souffle up. <laughs> never, never mind Norway, I couldn't get my souffle up. And uh, it's the same with focus. It's just got to be bang on precise. Um, <coughs> so that's the fourth and the final one. If you've ever been to the Reich Museum in Amsterdam, which if you, if you haven't, if people listening to this haven't and they get a chance, it's the best art museum in the world. You know, here's a, a maritime nation of tiny, small maritime nation for, that for four centuries controlled the art world. It's quite extraordinary that Holland, from about 1400 to about 1800, controlled the art world. Why is that? Well, they've, they, sent, they sent a lot of their painters down to Italy. So there was always sort of constant regeneration. Um, I guess because of their maritime roots they were visually exposed to more but i don't think that's a good enough reason because so many of the pictures they painted were domestic scenes that didn't require that international contextuality uh but there's a room there just full of rembrandts and there's a rembrandt the size of your window here uh it's a very famous picture of the night watchman there are people that will stand and cry and look at including me and they'll look at that picture for 45 minutes, painting. I think the best pieces of art, whether it's a photograph or a Rembrandt or whatever, can be looked at for a long time. If, um, if I look at my pictures, and I, I'm my biggest critic of my pictures, if I look at, I've been in the studio the last two days, and I've, I looked at my work for the last six weeks, and there are pictures that I thought were good, and then I see them printed the size of table tennis tables, and if my engagement is less than 10 seconds, I've failed. It should, you should be looking at it time. And that's why that picture of you works. Yeah. Because people can look at it for a long time. So engagement. Yeah. So those, those would be my five things. What about more mundane things like lighting? Uh, you kind of take those as red. I mean, I think that... <clears throat> There are certain you've got there's certain things that you've just got to get right before you even get into the game. But understanding the language of light, understanding the importance of working against the light. I, I tend to work against the light. So I always say to young kids that come in to um, for some advice or an intern, if you're ever taking a photograph and you can feel the sun on your neck, on the back of your neck, your camera's in the wrong position. Um, you should never feel the sun on the back of your neck. I, you should never be photographing directly with the light. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but normally uh, we tend to photograph, or I tend to photograph at about 45 degrees either side of the source of light. Got it. Um, it just makes it so much more interesting. Really? Sometimes, of course, in the big bad world of not being able to stage things, you can't control where your subject matter is in the light. But if where you can control it, you shouldn't you shouldn't have the sun behind you, and that's a mistake a lot of people make. I think. I remember this movie when I was growing up it was really funny called The In Laws, but not the remake, the old one, right. Peter Falk, and and he plays a CIA agent where uh, he's tells he's he, he's an undercover. They don't know he's a CIA agent. He gets into this family and. His wife is telling these stories about like how he's in the, the bush and he had these, you know, the, the you know, it was, it was a tsetse flies the size of birds carrying children away in, in their beak and this funny story. And he goes, yeah, it's a shame those, the pictures I took, they would have made it into National Geographic, whatever they got ruined in the exposure. Is there any situations that you've been in where you took amazing, you had this amazing moment, but you lost it. It didn't, you couldn't pull it off. We had like the pitch, like the, the opportunity of a lifetime. Because I, I don't want to ask the stupid question like any regrets. But I'm talking, is there anything that just an almost moment no. that you had? No, much worse than that, mate. I, I did the first 50 minutes of, of the World Cup semi final, West Germany, France. It was quite a busy 50 minutes. And I went to open my camera to take the first roll of film out and I hadn't put a roll of film in my camera. <laughs> because <laughs> in those days, the camera wouldn't tell you. You'd get to 36, and you'd take the film out. Ah. And I hadn't put a film in. Um, <laughs> I, Rough night the night before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I am. Um, um, in terms of 
in the old days with black and white, you would um, you'd have to be careful with X-ray machines. I mean, the, the the most famous story of the lot, of course, you probably know this, is when the Hungarian photographer Robert Kappa went over with your troops on Omaha Beach on D-Day, and he took six rolls of film, and then he went back to London that next day. Um, and f- five out of the six rolls of film were ruined because someone flicked the light switch in the darkroom. So those great pictures of D-Day on the beach, the immersive ones, they're from the one film roll that survived. The other five had been lost in the darkroom. So I guess that's the most infamous story. I mean, for, from from my side, I've uh, I uh, I've lost cameras where the where. Um, the whatever's been inside has been ruined because lions in the old days lions lions take your cameras away and in the old days where um, what do you mean they, they if, because we use remote control so a lot of in order to get close we will set the cameras up on the ground and i'll operate them from two or three hundred yards away so i can get that immersive close-up look and of course if a lion then sees a camera it's a bit like a kitten or a cat in a bowl of string. It will take. Um, n- nowadays, you can sort it because you can have GPS on your camera, so you can find out where the lion is going to have left it. But in the old days, uh, you, the camera might be gone for good. The, the one, the one, the one thing that will eat your camera because cameras aren't that attractive. But the, the you'll never guess the animal that will actually eat your camera. You can have you're allowed three guesses. I'll give you a clue. Do you want a clue? Three guesses. All right, all right ready? Gorilla. No, they won't give a damn. Okay. Um, want a clue? Yeah. Um, they are they're they're not an animal that people hold in huge affection. They're portrayed in uh, co- animated film as being the bad guys. Jackals? Oh uh, no, I mean uh, uh, a hyena. Yeah, yeah. So hyenas, and they will just they'll just destroy your camera. Chew it. Yeah, with their teeth, those sides there. You know, they'll, they'll kill it. <laughs> and the card inside it. So I've lost one like that. Tell me what is coming for you this year. Assuming the pandemic eases and you can start doing your thing, what's the plans for this year? Do you have it mapped? You map your years out. Like how far in advance is your is your uh, schedule oh, no, mapped normally, out? Uh, we're still saying if uh, God saw us making plans, he'd laugh at us all. Right. Um, but normally we're about uh, twelve months ahead. Uh, uh, hopefully we've got a TV series, which is going to be quite fun. You've got to come on an episode of, of that. Um, on what network is that? Um, it's yet to be. It's in the throes of people down there at the moment, so we'll see what happens. But I I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that it will be uh, um, Netflix. So, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Um, the um, uh, we go to Montana a lot, uh, and of course, uh, movie makers have always loved Montana. The, Robert Redford shot an awful lot up there. We um, wouldn't be that, that shot. Oh yeah, of course, great, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and the scenery is majestic. Yeah, that big sky, big scenery. sky. Yeah, but it's the people because I think it's the only place in the world where they don't know about the pandemic yet. There's people up in the hills that they haven't come down from the hills yet. <laughs> you know, there's, there's maybe a, there's maybe a few tribes in the Amazon, and then it's some of the villages in Montana that, uh, uh, but we, we all seriously, we know, we know some characters there. That, I met a few. Yeah, you did indeed. Um, and we what was have, the name of that bar? A great bar we went to. Uh, we took in, the, Butte, in Butte, Montana. Yeah, we took the photo. What was it called? The, uh, 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 what was it called? The old something. It had, yeah, Silver Bullet. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Silver Bullet in, in Butte, Montana. Uh, but, uh, so we're, we're, we're filming up there. Um, we're filming in, uh, uh, very close to some of the big native Indian reservations um, and close to where Custer's last stand was. And uh, I'm excited. We've got some uh, great characters. Um, I've uh, collaborated with Cindy Crawford in the past and she is the ultimate professional and a joy to work with. And uh, hopefully um, she, we've persuaded her to come up again. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's rather incongruous having an uh, international icon like that in some of the seediest bars you can possibly imagine, which is the whole point. <laughs> yeah, I saw some of those pictures. They were great with the wolf on the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With Cindy, yeah. and who was the other? It was Cindy and... Uh, uh, Roxana from Te- Texas, who's excellent as well. Um, now, we have fun up there. It's difficult. But it, it, 
until I'm quite keen to be here for your election. Um, I don't I don't have uh, a view, um, but I think it's going to be a tumultuous time in, in U.S. history. And, yeah. uh, um, and now that I'm here, because it's quite difficult for Brits to get in here, um, you don't care what passport we've got, but you do care where you spent the last two weeks. So in order for a Brit to get into America now, I had to go via Rwanda. Can you imagine that, that in order to get into America, a Brit has to go and spend two weeks in Rwanda, then he can get in. Um, so now that I'm here, there's no point leaving again because otherwise I'll have to go back through Rwanda for two weeks. I'm or, or Kenya or Tanzania. What I think you, you ever think about going into outer space? Um, well, I, a lot of my friends would say I'd spent most of my life with my head in the clouds anyway. <laughs> so, I don't know what, what about I don't like know about, a shot from like, you know, going up in a rocket or something, International Space Station, that sort of stuff. Does that intrigue you or no? It's just too cold and too hard to get. I, I, you know, under, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, but underwater photography, uh, I'm in awe of people that do underwater photography, but it doesn't sell very well. And I think the reason it doesn't sell very well is that we're not fish. I think if if we were fish and we had money, we would buy underwater photography because we'd go, oh, there's my mate Billy, you know, down by the coral reef. I haven't seen them for ages or whatever. But because we're not fish, we can't relate to Nemo in the coral or, or, or even a big whale shark or whatever it is. I think the danger um, for me with, with, with going and photographing from space is we can't really relate to it either. I, I go to... Let's, let's say um, three of the most beautiful countries in the world. And we're all going to have our choices. By the way, I think America is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. But let's, uh, three, my three would be uh, Namibia in, in what was Southwest Africa, a stunning country. I've been Des- there. Um, I think Greenland is very special. Never been there. Uh, and uh, I think Chile is very special, but let's let's just stick to let's stick to let's just speak to uh, stick to and Argentina. And I know you've been there as yeah. well. Uh, let's uh, stick to Namibia and Greenland. They have a combined population of about two point six million people, uh, who are familiar with how beautiful uh, Namibia is and how beautiful Greenland is. I think you could be a photographer and spend all your life in these two most beautiful places, but I just don't know about the commerciality of your art because it pertains, it's special to those 2.6 million people, but to the rest, um, if someone lives in Chicago, they're going to find Chicago much more interesting sure. than a picture of Namibia or a picture of Greenland. Interesting. Which is, and we like Chicago. We think that's uh, very, uh, from an urban beauty about as good as it gets in the world. How do people find out more about your work uh, in terms of just, uh, you know, if they want to buy pieces, what's the easiest way to start, you know, putting in, what's the price range of the stuff that you have out there? Uh, well, we have some pieces that are, that are expensive. We only do, so when we, when I'm, I get a good picture and I, I don't get that many ones that I consider really strong a year. I think the mistake a lot of photographers can make, and I've made in my past, is thinking that you take too many, think you, you've got a lot of good pictures. Uh, I had a, two days in Africa last week where I was working with probably Germany's top model, uh, the world's biggest elephant. And you just thought, that's quite a punchy combination. You've got the world's biggest elephant and Germany's top model. And I took 11 pictures in those two days. Um, and then we finally got it, got it right. But if, uh, uh, so I probably take about 10 pictures a year I consider to be strong and maybe five that are that I'm, uh, are are a one out of ten out of ten nine out of tens um and we restrict the supply um and the supply tends to start at around about fifteen thousand um uh and that includes the frame which is always standardized I mean, one of our business sayings is tom ford tom ford tom ford so there's always a constancy of production mm-hmm. and some branding and then just occasionally last year we had a couple of pictures that got to a hundred thousand um uh, but uh no more than yeah no more than that so it's about from about 15 to 15 20 to 100 um they uh, we have galleries uh in america we have galleries in um uh permanent galleries in aspen vale uh, uh nashville miami 
Palm Beach, Los Angeles, uh, uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, Chicago, uh, and our best gallery by a by a bit in America is in Dallas, uh, and uh, Dallas is for us. It's a big art market, the big walls, but we, we Dallas is, is is a place that we is a kind of our epicenter in, in the U.S. Rather bizarrely, most people would think it would be in L.A. or New York. Interesting. Dallas is a great market for us. I do a lot of business in Dallas. It's a great place. Well, there's a positivity and there's a, a set of hospitality and there's a sense of, um, you know, when I first went to Dallas, I didn't know anyone. And I, I hired a girl uh, as my PR and we had five or six events. And the final event, it was a hot day, so I think everyone had better things to do. Three people turned up at my final event. One of which was her, and she was taken off. She was taken off to rehab halfway through the event. So then there was just then there was just two people left, and uh, uh, we went to the Dallas airport. And uh, I said to my business partner, "I think we spent a hundred thousand dollars this week, and I haven't sold a fucking picture. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry um, that I've made this misjudgment call in, in Dallas." And she said. Uh, David, I don't know. I think you've made a couple of good connections there, and now we sell four million dollars a year in Dallas. So it was going from that to it being our strongest sales center. And the, and, the, and, the, and the clue is never quit. If you feel, if your instincts are that it's right, persist. Can't be a quitter. There you go. That's true in any business, but yeah. I guess it's also true in the art world, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So as long as you believe in yourself and you have people that believe in you. Yeah. What's the website? DavidYarrow.com? We actually thought about uh, calling it Jordan Belford to get more traffic. <laughs> <laughs> but it was taken. <laughs> it was taken. <laughs> and, uh, we, we, I went for my name, which I know is very dull and traditional. So David Yarrow. Yeah, you can, that's Y-A-R-R-O-W. That's right. It's a, it's a Scottish weed. <laughs> not, not, not an illicit one. <laughs> Everybody, listen, check out David's stuff. It's amazing. Uh, and you should buy some stuff too and put it on your walls because I'll tell you what, there's something about the pictures that you take. Some some people just have a knack and you just have a knack. And I think there's a strategy in there, there's passion. Um, and I think a lot of forethought as well. I you know, really just like this idea that you're intersecting uh, the first thing you said today was that you're intersecting authenticity with commerciality. Yep. And I think that leads to a really good ultimate result. Obviously, the world is saying so because you are massively successful. Anyway, David, I love you. Thanks for coming on. The, the Wolf's Den, you're the best. Thanks, Thanks buddy. Sean. Cheers. Everyone, share this with your friends. Another great episode of The Wolf's Den, and we'll see you next time. All right, here's the deal. So America gets back to work. You want and need every possible advantage out there to succeed in the new economy. Smart companies run on NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud-based business system. So receive your free guide right now at netsuite.com slash wolf. That is netsuite.com slash wolf. All right, real quick, listen, if you're a CEO, you're a sales manager, or you're involved in hiring for your company, I want you to check out my new organization, Straight Line Hiring. What we do is we deliver expertly trained salespeople to companies like yours. World-class salespeople trained by me and delivered to you on demand. Go to my website, jordanbelfort.com. Check out Straight Line Hiring, the only way to grow your company with certainty. All right, this next section here is about business and making lots of money. Here's the deal. I'm having a small group of people over to my home in Los Angeles, and the question all of them are asking is, What's next in life? You know, these are people who had mass success already and they're looking to see what's that one thing, that one distinction that will take them to the next level of money and success. So you'll be getting close right now to that seven figures a year. Maybe you're trying to get to eight figures a year. The point is that this is an opportunity for you right now to come to my house in Beverly Hills, Los Angeles here, right? And join with nine other people all of them ultra high achievers to attend my mastermind event, which is led by me. 
Now, what's going to happen here is very special, and it's going to be nothing short of life-changing. You and this group of top business leaders are going to spend the weekend with me in intense, regimented brainstorming sessions, where you're also going to get to have some time, about an hour or more, with one-on-one -on -one consulting with me personally, along with a special breakout session where I'm going to be sharing the most cunning edge secrets of sales, marketing strategy, things I'm using myself right now to scale my own businesses in a massive way. But the real magic, by the way, of this mastermind is you're also going to get to sit in the hot seat in front of all these other top performers. In other words, Every person in the mastermind is going to have that opportunity for an hour or more to sit in the hot seat where all the collective energy, brain power, and experience will be laser guided on you, focused on you and your company and helping you take things to the next level. Things that you thought were impossible before this day will start to become very possible for you as soon as you leave. When this is over, you're going to go home feeling energized with new ideas new plans, and most importantly, a network of very powerful new contacts who are going to help you make them happen fast. In other words, I'm opening up my entire Rolodex to you as all the people who are attending to do the same. I'm telling you the results that you're going to get here from this mastermind will be nothing short of staggering. Now, a little bit about how this actually works. First, you're going to fly into Los Angeles and my driver, Abdul, will pick you up at the airport. We'll have your favorite drinks waiting for you at my house. We'll also have a world-class chef there to cater some of the best meals you've ever had. This is going to be fun and it's going to be about learning and business and camaraderie, all the best things in life wrapped up in the one. I guarantee you will walk out of this mastermind event with a new, improved, much bolder and more powerful vision for your future, a new plan and massively powerful new context to take your life and your business to the next level. So what you need to do right now is go to jordanbelfort.com slash mastermind and apply. That's jordanbelfort.com slash mastermind and apply right now. Do not miss this opportunity. It's a once in a lifetime and it's life changing. Hey guys, JB here, the Wolf of Wall Street. And guess what? I'm giving away for the first time ever this awesome ebook on sales and persuasion. Click on the link below to download this ebook here. It is literally life changing. Zero cost. It's free. My gift to you as an introduction into the power and the righteousness of straight line sales and persuasion in terms of what it does to you, in terms of turning you into a world class closer a top producer in your field, and truly allowing you to move through life in an empowered way. I don't care what you do for a living, whether it's business or personal, you're always looking to try to get your point across to someone else, to try to sell someone on your ideas, your concepts, your hopes, your dreams. Without having the ability to do that, you're literally moving through life, moving through the world with your hands tied behind your back. At least with this ebook, by going through it very quickly, by the way, it's a, it's, a, it's a swift read written by me, so it's funny as well. It's very snappy in my usual voice, right? But you go through this, it's going to have a profound impact on not just your ability to close, but to simply move through life in an empowered way, to negotiate effectively, to get people to see your point, to share whatever it is that's in your heart and your mind with other people around you, and to do it in a way that's interesting, that keeps them hanging on your every word. That's what this ebook is about, and it is a must read. Bottom line, when you choose to read it, that's your choice. This is a must read. I call it a required course. Bottom line.